I graduated at the University of Padova. This is a beautiful city in the north of Italy. Uh, and this is called Prato della Valle. It's the second largest square in uh, Europe. And the Padova is uh, famous for uh, two reasons. The first one is uh, Galileo taught there. And the second one, uh, famous for the students, uh, the original Upper Street. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I moved to uh, Rome, the Eternal City. And I used to live here, uh, lots of delicacies. <laughs> um, and uh, I got my PhD here uh, in Sapienta University and uh, in collaboration with the National Institute of uh, Geophysics and Volcanology. I did my experiment here on uh, this machine called Rotary Shear, the formation apparatus, and also familiarized with uh, this one, the biaxial called Brava. Um, and then here I am, finally, <laughs> as a postdoc at uh, Liverpool University. So, but uh, the common thread uh, for uh, among all this uh, career path is uh, faults, <laughs> are the faults. And uh, this is a beautiful outcrop in central Italy from uh, Mount Vettore. Is, um, so that is telling us that faults are the result, of, well, that earthquakes are the result of friction and stabilities along faults. And this, uh, especially this fault, uh, was reactivated several times along uh, the so-called Amatrice North sequence. And it's also a beautiful example uh, that tells us uh, the difference between uh, in seismic energy released uh, between uh, uh, 6.0 and only a 0.5 difference in magnitude, 50 times uh, um, larger in energy released. Um, but, um, so the um, if you speak if you speak with um, field geologist uh, is telling you that uh, uh, the fault architecture in reality is very complex. So fault can uh, uh, accommodate uh, um, plate motion in uh, several ways, and uh, the most uh, iconic example is uh, the San Andreas fault that uh, has some portions that. Uh, are creeping, so they don't cause earthquakes, they creep seismically, and the other regions that uh, are locked and uh, hosted the earthquake in the past. Um, however, um, fault behavior is not just uh, seismic, uh, a seismic, uh, it's not black and white, there are several uh, uh, shades of gray. And uh, this was, um, this discovery was uh, thanks, uh, thanks to uh, 30 years of uh, uh, data collection of uh, high resolution uh, geodetic data um, and uh, that allowed us uh, to discover also something in the middle, which is called uh, slow earthquakes, slow sleep events. This is a very, th that's the, the first image of a, of a manuscript, of a, of a journal and that shows uh, that uh, in, the, in the past 30 years, uh, um, the slow earthquake gathered attention of uh, lots of uh, um, researchers and, uh, and also was object of, of several uh, uh, oceanic drilling campaigns. Um, so while uh, earthquakes are, uh, the largest earthquakes are mostly located uh, uh, along uh, plate boundaries, as you can see in this picture, that they illuminate uh, uh, plate boundaries. Uh, slow earthquakes are mostly, but not only, located uh, in uh, uh, along uh, subduction zones. And uh, as you can see in this picture, and the first one ever uh, um, detected, the first slow sleep event ever detected, was uh, in the Cascadia subduction zone. But uh, now let's have a look uh, at, um, at a subduction zone to better understand how they discovered these loss difference. So here's a subduction zone. Uh, all right, so how uh, loss lift events were detected. So consider a subduction zone that is uh, uh, frictionally locked in this area. 
and uh, a GPS station that is uh, uh, recording uh, the, um, the position. So um, due to plate motion, since uh, this is frictionally locked, elastic energy is being stored. And uh, this margin, the leading at margin of the continental plate is being pushed uh, uh, longitudinally due to the uh, elastic energy that is being stored due to the push and this that is frictionally locked. And this happens until friction is being overcome. And uh, uh, what they ob we observe is uh, an elastic rebound and uh, seismic energy release. So this is how they detected uh, uh, slow earthquakes. And this is the very first example along the Cascadia uh, subduction zone. And uh, with the GPS stations that are recording uh, this uh, elastic rebound of uh, four millimeters. Okay. Uh, so what's the difference between fast and the slow earthquakes, as the name can suggest, the uh, slip rate in slow earthquakes uh, is uh, significantly lower uh, with respect to uh, regular earthquakes, as you can see in this, di this diagram. It goes from uh, um, above, slightly above plate rate uh, to uh, about uh, a few microns per second. Uh, with respect to an earthquake uh, that uh, the fault fault slips of uh, about uh, one meter per second, uh, and uh, also the seismic rupture propagation uh, pro propagates uh, for earthquakes well kilometers per second, whereas uh, for uh, um, slow earthquakes uh, several magnitude of uh, order of magnitude lower. So uh, the duration is uh, what makes uh, is the big difference between the two, uh, despite the fact that also uh, they can even slow uh, um, earthquake can release uh, uh, seismic energy uh, comparable to a regular earthquake, even up to seven. But the difference is that this seismic energy is released over in the order of uh, hours, to days, uh, up to months or e even a year. So why is, is it important to study these low earthquakes? Well, they complete at first uh, a piece of the puzzle of the full sleep behavior and uh, they um, since they, they tend to be localized uh, at, um, at the margins of the uh, seismogenic zones, uh, in the subduction zones. Um, so uh, knowing how uh, stress is released by the slow sleep events is important to understand how stress is transferred and accumulated in the seismogenic zone. And also, uh, the other fact is that uh, um, slow earthquake can evolve to fast earthquakes, as uh, it happened during the top walkthrough sequence. So this is uh, the fault paths, uh, 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 slow slip fault paths, uh, that is completely uh, within embedded in the uh, seismic slip fault paths uh, during the earthquake uh, uh, the 2011 magnitude 9 of the top okay. so um, in order to understand the uh, single the what controls the mode of fault slip we need to systematically understand the single parameters that could control it and to do that to to do a systematic analysis the laboratory work is uh, fundamental and so uh, that's what we, we are doing in the lab. And, and I'm going to show you in the next few slides. But before that, uh, we need to know some uh, basic, simple concepts of uh, fault mechanics. So the father of uh, fault mechanics is uh, Leonardo da Vinci that uh, did uh, his first, uh, the first friction, friction uh, experiment ever, the first systematic friction tests uh, by sliding uh, blocks uh, of different, uh, different uh, area 
uh, and different way um, and by driving it at uh, constant uh, velocity. And uh, this is observation when they were then formalized by uh, Amontons uh, in the so-called Amonton friction law that uh, relates uh, the shear stress acting on an interface with the normal stress and which is whose ratio is parameterized by the friction coefficient. This is uh, rather important uh, for our studies uh, since uh, uh, tectonic loaded, loading is uh, redistributed uh, along the fault as a combination of uh, normal stress and shear stress. However, this is a very simplistic uh, model. Uh, what is missing uh, is how elastic energy is stored. Why do we have instabilities? So uh, what is missing is this part. And uh, uh, this is the spring slider model that uh, is the one that is already still used both in the laboratory and in uh, uh, numerical modeling to understand the falsely behavior. Um, so uh, basically the, all the machines that we have are uh, uh, complex uh, spring sliders. So this is, uh, we will see later on, uh, this is uh, the one installed here at the uh, laboratory in Liverpool. This is the one uh, uh, the rotary here was using mostly in Rome during my PhD. Okay, uh, but uh, okay, so let's move on to what we are currently doing in the lab. What, what we uh, are testing uh, is pulverized material simulating fault gauss. It can be also bare rock surfaces, depending on the fault. And uh, we apply in several ways, uh, the normal stress. These are three different configurations that uh, we can use uh, in the laboratories and in general. And uh, we apply, we we drive, uh, uh, we, we uh, um, deform at a constant uh, uh, shear velocity. And uh, during that uh, experiment, uh, we monitor both the displacement of fault and on fault. And uh, we, during the, uh, the deformation at constant slip velocity, we measure the evolution of the shear stress uh, and thus the evolution of friction coefficient. Okay, so this is our uh, configuration here uh, in the Liverpool laboratory, in direct shear, in which uh, we uh, apply uh, shear stress uh, through a uh, ram, vertical ram, and the deformation is uh, uh, accommodated, uh, 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 the shear stress is accommodated along the fault by, uh, thanks to these uh, uh, rubber spacers. So what we do in the lab is, uh, is um, if, we, if we try to extrapolate uh, uh, to uh, the large scale, it's a, uh, it's just a small patch in uh, in the in the real world, so that's why I made it so small. So this is the spring slider, the, the slider, and uh, yeah, this is just a picture of it, and which is jacketed during our test, and the jacket can be different uh, de depending on the temperature we are applying. And uh, to apply con uh, confining pressure, a normal stress, so we have put it in a pressure vessel, which can be heated depending on uh, uh, the temperature that we want to reach through the, these fan heaters. And uh, the shear stress is applied through the movement of the vertical ram at the bottom, located at the bottom. In uh, our laboratory, we can uh, uh, deform, uh, we can uh, mimic in situ uh, stress conditions up to uh, 250 MPa, which correspond to uh, 15 uh, kilometers depth. And uh, uh, with currently, we can uh, reach up to 200 degrees Celsius 
Uh, however, uh, we are working to uh, to reach up to to we're working on an apparatus to reach up to 750 by changing the confining medium. Okay, so this is the Fortner apparatus, uh, a sketch and a, a, with a section of it. And uh, here is where the, the slider is located. And uh, here is how it looks uh, in reality with, within the, the slider within the sample assembly and, and that will be placed uh, into the pressure vessel, that is this one. And uh, the confining pressure is applied through uh, this for, uh, confining pressure line uh, using silicon oil. And uh, these two are the fluid pressure lines to apply an upstream and a downstream. And during our test, we are controlling uh, the uh, fluid pressure and confining pressure constant by, uh, thanks to our servo, uh, these two servo controlled motors. Okay, so um, let's make a further step. So the, these are the, uh, what I described earlier were the basic experiment to quantify and understand uh, uh, the seismic potential of holes. Uh, what we are doing is, is running velocity steps. So uh, velocity step is a, a type of experiment in which we change uh, suddenly the slip velocity during a shearing. And uh, therefore, the uh, Amonton's law that uh, was good before. So uh, to fully describe uh, this complex behavior, uh, we have we what we are using is the rate and state friction law that uh, incorporates uh, this term seen in uh, the Amonton's law, plus uh, the rate dependence and the so-called state dependent on friction. So the rate dependence is uh, quantified by this parameter A, and which is called direct effect. And the state dependence is quantified by this parameter B, that is uh, uh, the evolution uh, effect. And this is theta is the state variable. So let's uh, separate the two contribution. So the rate dependent effect uh, is uh, the effect of the sun, sudden change uh, in uh, velocity that uh, determines a sudden jump in friction, parameterized by A again. The state dependent effect uh, is uh, an effect that uh, kind of um, um, is a memory effect that tends to uh, keep memory of how the uh, strong default uh, was, but this memory tends to fade with time and sleep. And this is quantified at uh, while reaching new steady state condition after the new velocity by B. And together they get A minus B. So uh, to uh, extrapolate this parameter, A, B, D, C, which is how uh, how much displacement it takes to reach uh, from this level to this. Um, we need to do some inverse modeling uh, that is obtained by uh, coupling uh, this uh, rate and state friction law with the, the state evolution law, time dependent, and the, these are the main two, and uh, by coupling uh, the elasticity. But the most important parameter is uh, that we are going to discuss that you will see a lot during our future work uh, is uh, this one, this A minus B, uh, that is obtained at the steady state friction conditions by uh, incorporating this term into the main rate of state friction law equation. So this is just an example of experiment uh, which uh, we can clearly see A, B, and A minus B. What is important is that uh, A minus B, when it's negative, uh, the fault is uh, called the velocity weakening, 
So it is prone to earthquake uh, instabilities, to frictional instabilities. Uh, whereas uh, when A minus B is positive, the fault is called velocity strengthening. And this means that the fault tends to slip A seismically. Okay. So this is uh, just uh, to summarize, since uh, A and B can uh, look uh, like uh, uh, complex uh, uh, terms, but uh, they're nothing, mm, they're nothing but a generalization of uh, the static friction coefficient. So this is basically A, and, and that after sliding, uh, evolves uh, to a uh, dynamic uh, friction coefficient, which is proportional to B. As you can see, this analogy is very clear. Okay, so now after this premise, we are ready to uh, move on to the core of this talk. So what control the mode of fault slip? Uh, but uh, before doing that, I forgot that. Uh, <laughs> um, so we are what we are measuring in the laboratory, we are just uh, measuring a point in the fault, as I was saying. So what, what uh, is important, but our experiments are important uh, uh, for, uh, for the upscaling for numerical modeling. And uh, so uh, it, what, what matters is not just the one single fault path, is the interaction between one fault path and the other that is what determines the overall fault slip behavior in, uh, in the fault. So this is a, a very comprehensive, uh, this uh, analogic model. But what uh, we do is, uh, yeah, this more complex uh, numerical models in which uh, in this specific case, we got uh, um, a fault path that is uh, potentially unstable and uh, a fault path that is uh, uh, um, creeping, so it, it slips aseismically. And uh, what uh, this work uh, shows is that, uh, oh, I can't load the video, okay. <laughs> and now I could before, okay. Uh, what, what this work shows is that even uh, uh, creeping margins can, uh, um, can be destructive due to the um, dynamic weakening uh, that is caused by the uh, neighboring weak, path, uh, weak fault paths. I'm sorry I couldn't load the video. <laughs> All right, so now we are really ready to uh, dive into the single parameters that can control uh, a false slip that we investigate in, in the laboratory. Um, let's start over with the mineralogy. So the min this is a, a overall diagram from a different experiments that shows that uh, essentially that frictionally uh, strong materials uh, are like a quartz spotic, tend to be uh, unstable, uh, whereas uh, uh, like clay rich materials. Uh, tend to be frictionally weaker, uh, but uh, exhibit positive A minus B, so they should be uh, more stable. And this is also confirmed by uh, the study we did on the Nankai trough material collected by Oceanographic Dr Drilling Program. And that clearly shows uh, a uh, decreasing friction coefficient with increasing clay content. Although uh, this clay content was uh, that was from 40 to 70 was in, enough to uh, have uh, to, to entail uh, a significant difference in A minus B. So, but what must be said is that this experiment were run at the room temperature. And uh, what uh, actually easy is demonstrates with our work uh, is that uh, temperature matter in, in destabilizing the fault. In, in this work, she uh, mixed uh, uh, 
quartz and clay reach out with different proportions. And uh, the overall behavior is uh, that uh, the um, the fault tends to become uh, overall more unstable with increasing temperature, and uh, and of course the given the same temperature the fault uh, uh, is more unstable the lower the clay content in a homogeneous fault. And this is uh, similar to findings uh, in uh, uh, by Sabina Den Hartog that uh, worked here as well. Um, this is from uh, Utrecht laboratory data. And uh, at uh, the overlapping conditions, the behavior is uh, rather similar with uh, this composition of clay and quartz. But uh, also this uh, uh, study further demonstrates uh, that uh, the temperature, the higher temperature up to 300 degrees tends to uh, further destabilizing the fault. So again, easy uh, demonstrated uh, about the dilatancy. The dilatancy hardening is a rather important uh, uh, parameter uh, since uh, they, it can uh, um, dump uh, the um, uh, uh, fall, fall slip uh, nucleation and dynamic rupture propagation, and which can turn into a slow slip event, for example. Uh, and I forgot to say, then you can see hardening uh, in the presence of uh, pore fluid, which uh, is uh, rather relevant for uh, uh, the fall core area. The, the infold area. So what Easy did was to develop uh, an unbiased method to calculate the data latency that in a triaxial machine is more complicated than uh, I was uh, doing in Rome, for example, that we could monitor the layer thickness. In this case, uh, uh, we have to monitor the change in pore, pore volume uh, during uh, shearing and during the velocity steps. And uh, uh, easy quantifies the uh, dilatancy with the dilatancy coefficient, which is uh, the, essentially the dilatancy that is normalized by the velocity jump. And it's a uh, consistent, uh, um, consistent uh, dilation, uh, regardless of the clay content, which uh, well, with a peak on uh, 30%, which depends on uh, the default, uh, the grain size, the grain shape, the aspect ratio, and the fall roughness. So another parameter, moving on, another parameter important is uh, the fault rock heterogeneity. Because in the fault core, actually, uh, there are, as we have seen also in uh, the analogic video, uh, uh, the, the video with the analogic model, um, the fault core is actually made of uh, different uh, fault patches, is uh, heterogeneous. So what John did, uh, did a brilliant work by juxtaposing laterally different fault patches with different uh, mineralogy and thus uh, different uh, uh, properties. And uh, he compared the same result, the, the results of this, of this friction test, with uh, uh, a ma uh, homogeneous material with the same mineralogical composition. And uh, what, uh, what uh, John saw was uh, the, that uh, heterogeneous faults are frictionally weaker during shearing. You can see the, clearly the comparison between the, the two colors. But also that uh, even uh, weaker uh, heterogeneous faults are even more unstable than uh, uh, homogeneous faults. And there are several reasons behind that uh, um, that could be inferred from uh, mi microstructures. Um, so the first one was uh, uh, is the clay smearing that you can see here. Uh, of a material uh, during shearing. 
Um, so be because there is a larger proportion of sleeping surface uh, uh, where uh, um, where the clay uh, is uh, subjected to shearing. Uh, the second one is uh, the differential compaction between the gauss and the clay that leads to some uh, stress uh, redistribution. And the third one is, uh, well, uh, you can see here, for example, probably here you can't see, but uh, that is the development of uh, some uh, shear localization uh, that uh, leads to some uh, stress concentration. So all this reason tends to uh, weakens the fault and makes it more unstable. And uh, this is just to summarize that uh, uh, heterogeneous fault are, are weaker, but also more prone to earthquakes with respect to the homogeneous counterpart. Okay. So the next part is uh, the sleep velocity. Sleep velocity is another uh, important uh, is another important uh, uh, parameter. As, as you can see, the increase in the velocity tends to stabilize the fault. This work from uh, uh, Lehman, Maron, and Suffer. Um, so this means that the transition from a slow to, to high sleep velocity, so that at a certain point, we could have uh, like a, a cutoff of sleep velocity that uh, um, that dumps uh, the uh, sleep instability and turns it into a slow sleep event. So we don't know uh, because most of the experiments are run at this range, and uh, we need uh, to know this range. And the, the, the last uh, parameter, but not the least, is the port fluid pressure. Uh, the port fluid pressure, uh, so the absolute value, not the transient uh, due to dilatancy, uh, increasing. It can be uh, counterintuitive, but uh, increasing uh, port fluid pressure can uh, uh, um, increases the stability of the fault. And this is particularly relevant for a slow sleep event since uh, they are mostly associated to, uh, um, it, they, they are inferred to be, to be uh, associated to high fluid pressure. And there are several lines of evidence, in this case, uh, seismic data, but also core logging, borehole data that uh, go in the same direction. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, the effect in normal stress is varied as well. In this other type of experiment that was also similar to the one that Affinit et al. Uh, did in uh, Penn State on another machine. Uh, so John kept the normal stress, uh, the effect in normal stress constant. So the difference between normal stress and fluid pressure and uh, he ran uh, the fault at constant uh, sleep velocity of three microns per second. What we can see, uh, and it systematically varied uh, the fluid pressure. What we can see is a, a clear transition from uh, stick sleep behavior, that means uh, earthquake sleep, to uh, more uh, transitional behavior. So this is slow sleep. And so this is what uh, we've learned so far um, during uh, our test. We learned a lot. So we learned uh, the effect of the temperature, of the latency, of the material heterogeneity, the velocity and fluid pressure. However, as you can see here, there is a, a big, still a big uh, knowledge gap, experimental gap that we need to fill. And uh, this is what uh, my specific grant uh, is about. Um, so uh, we need to understand, uh, we need to cover, oh, well, most of the, uh, the points here. Uh, and in particular, uh, since experimentally also we can uh, reach this uh, uh, stress, uh, this uh, depth, in, in a rig, 
So we mostly focus on uh, the shallow earthquakes, and which are again associated to high free pressure and uh, near little static. So this is our project target, and uh, they're mostly uh, located uh, at uh, uh, about the seven kilo six seven kilometers depth. Um, so in this grant, I focus on this, on these experimental conditions, uh, to test uh, the, uh, to test especially uh, if there is a cutoff velocity with increasing sleep velocity, and uh, a different temperature. And as a uh, free information, since we can measure it easily in the, our laboratory, so also the bilatency is going to be measured. Uh, uh, in doing so, I uh, my work is divided in three areas. So, and the first two is to uh, be able to uh, make sure that uh, the data well were reliable. Um, so, I'm not going to focus on uh, especially the the first two. So, in this talk, is just talking about the the work packet three. Uh, but I'm going just to mention the first two that I invite you to uh, look uh, this paper that has been published in uh, Geosphere and also the GitHub code. Um, and uh, regarding the second one, uh, that will, it will be presented uh, uh, well here in the Liverpool Manchester Rock Death meeting in the nineteen and uh, lab chat as also but so all this is uh, preparatory to the uh, AGU event in which I'm going to present a poster on this so if you're uh, in Washington in December I invite you to look at my poster as well uh, and uh, so let's jump into the last part uh, roll of temperature at and sleep velocity from plate to sub seismic slip rates. So in particular, my target, the geological target, uh, is understanding the uh, Nankai-like uh, subduction zones, which is uh, rich in uh, illite, in clay, and quartz. Uh, so I used, uh, for this reason, the Rochester shale as a good analog. Here is a picture of Rochester shield that is uh, then crushed and sealed. And this is the final product that is being used for the tests. Um, and as I was uh, mentioning, the slow sleep events uh, in this area are mostly concentrated uh, about uh, six, seven kilometers depth. So this, uh, this plus, uh, the information on the pore pressure allow me to uh, allow me to constrain the experimental parameters. Therefore, uh, this uh, six seven kilometers is equivalent uh, to roughly one fifty MPa uh, normal stress, and uh, I use the near lithostatic supra hydrostatic condition. Uh, 120 MPa, this means uh, a very low effective normal stress and at this uh, range of uh, temperature and sleep velocity near plate rate to uh, stop seismic sleep. Okay, so I used the, uh, again uh, this uh, sample assembly um, and uh, uh, this are my experimental data. Well, this bunch of experiments cover the uh, higher sleep velocity range. Um, what you can see still uh, the, that the material is uh, frictionally weak, and but also I, I, I run the same time type of experiment, I actually realized I could uh, cover the entire slip uh, velocity uh, range I wanted to cover. Um, so I did at uh, 50 uh, degrees Celsius, 
and uh, this one ended earlier because it uh, miserably failed. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the information that we can get from this test uh, is uh, still important. In fact, if we zoom in here, uh, we could see that is what is probably a slow sleep event. So uh, we also collected the uh, rate and state friction properties, A minus B, that is telling us if a fault is stable or unstable. And uh, at the range of velocity of temperature so far collected, they're um, pretty stable. And this was uh, uh, Sabina and Hartog uh, experimental range. However, we got the big suspect that uh, 150, since uh, we observe a slow sleep event, it is possible that uh, uh, our uh, a minus B is something around here. All right, and also this one will be uh, part of, uh, 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 will be presented as a poster in Washington early December. And uh, that's it. I would like to thank you all for uh, your attention. <laughs> So, you report the impacts in the temperature and the Yes. So, it's about a low temperature part, but then it seems to rise again. Yes. So, uh, the reason is uh, I, I tried to have a look at the, also the paper. Uh, the reason is purely microstructure. So, to explain uh, the, the behavior of uh, of this A minus B with temperature, what, what we are doing is uh, uh, systematically uh, systematically uh, couple uh, the, the full microstructure as well. Mm -hmm. You show these slow sliding zones being at the very top of the subduction zone, very yes. the most extreme. So, uh, I would so probably, uh, yeah, in the shallow portion, uh, so this, this this is the uh, sleep velocity range, uh, sorry, the temperature range. Uh, however, uh, what uh, Sabina did uh, was uh, running a test uh, from one to a hundred. So it is very likely we, we have the suspects that are due to the higher temperature, uh, the higher sleep velocity that uh, tends to stabilize the fault. Uh, all these data are shifts slightly upwards, so they can't fully explain uh, why slow sleep events occur. So that's why we have to uh, fill uh, that knowledge gap. Uh, you can see clearly in this diagram. So this was uh, Sabina's experimental range, uh, which is, uh, and this is where all slow sleep events are occurring. And uh, this is where shallow slow sleep events occur. So we need to understand all this part to answer the question. Okay, uh, so in in, uh, in our test we can uh, we can uh, share both uh, um, we can share two types of uh, of rocks pulverized that uh, simulates the fault gouge and uh, the fault surfaces because we can find uh, in the field we can find both. Uh, I showed uh, at the very first part of the talk, uh, the Mount Vettore, for example, uh, that is uh, a, a fault surface. Uh, so for the fault gouts, 
uh, there is no problem because and so what we have to do is just uh, uh, to uh, or either we have uh, material from uh, the um, fault uh, zone that we collect in the field from the field or from uh, oceanographic campaign and we can kind of simulate it by looking at the mineralogy uh, the other one uh, we uh, it's a bit more uh, for the fault surfaces can be a bit more challenge challenging because uh, the the of the fault microstructure um, but uh, also there are uh, a few studies that can uh, uh, you can actually core through the the fault zone and uh, uh, simulate uh, what could happen so we can do all of those things it's mentioned about the sort of the numerical model yes and I wondered how straightforward it is to link between the experiments and the numerical models. Do you get parameter values which you can directly input into the numerical model, or is it more of a physical framework, or like how how straightforward is that? Uh, well, it's it's complicated, of course, uh, but in principle, oh, where is it? Mm. In principle, the main parameters, well, no, uh, yeah. I can't find it. Uh, so the model, here we go, yes. Uh, this is a very clear example because uh, it, you, you enter a different uh, rate and state friction properties. You enter A minus B, you enter uh, the DC. So how much uh, the, uh, with how many, uh, how much displacement do you need to, to weaken the fault? Uh, and you enter, uh, well, you enter also the elastic properties of the uh, surrounding medium because if that one that the parameter the the stiffness that determines how uh, the if a potential fault is uh, uh, gives earthquakes or not that I haven't mentioned in this talk. Um, so, uh, but these are the main parameters that the numerical modelers are using: a minus b, uh, d. Uh, char characteristic slip distance and the stiffness of the material. So, Dave has a quick question online. Okay. Um, um, can you ask if you could expand a little more on what you mean by increasing the fall pressure uh, stabilizing the fault? Um, okay. Uh, yes. So, uh, to understand this, uh, um let's see if i got a slide um, so we have to know the concept of uh, uh, critical uh, uh, fault uh, stiffness of the material um, not, not here not here uh, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, something like that. So um, the stabilizing the question was the stabilizing effect of the fluid pressure. Okay. So um, essentially, a fault uh, reactivates uh, and tends to give earthquakes when uh, uh, the decrease in friction with displacement. Uh, uh, is uh, larger than uh, the elasticity of the surrounding medium. So um, in this case, uh, well, this diagram I can uh, shows you very quick, very clearly. Uh, here, the friction decreases uh, from a, a, a static to a dynamic friction. Like if I were trying to move this table right now and was moving. Um, but in order to have uh, earthquake, uh, this decrease in friction has to uh, be uh, faster than uh, the um, 
elastic rebound uh, than the than the elasticity of uh, of the medium. So if this is faster, as you can see in this diagram, the elastic and sorry, the elasticity of the medium is defined by the stiffness of the material. So if this uh, friction decreases faster than uh, the elasticity, you got a force imbalance, and therefore you got uh, um, uh, instability until this area simplifying is equal to this one. So uh, this is uh, in simple, simple terms. In uh, general, uh, we say when K, the elasticity of the material is lower than the critical uh, stiffness of the fault patch, which is um, defined by, uh, I can't write it, but I can uh, write, try to write somewhere in the comment. Uh, so when K is lower than KC, which is equal to from uh, this comes from a linear elastic analysis b minus a times sigma n minus p pressure and which is all divided by dc so uh, when k is lower than kc um, the the fault uh, tends to give unstable slip and earthquakes, but as we increase the pore pressure, given the same K, uh, KC tends to become uh, um, well. Uh, KC tends to become uh, progressively similar to K, and therefore uh, uh, the material, even if it is velocity weakening tends to become more stable. So that's the reason why increasing pore pressure can uh, affect the critical stiffness of the fault, and therefore uh, the material is, is more stable. Yes. So the time scale, so the time scale of the reduction of pressure. Yes. So if we're talking numbers, what time scale are we talking about? The time scale of what? Sorry. So basically, you said the friction on the planes has to happen on a shorter time scale than the elasticity. Yes. Which physically makes the entire planet accelerate because it means you can't get if the thing goes mm, slightly before you get an elastic effect, you're not going to get that. Uh, yes. So, yeah. so, what is the time scale? So, I said faster, but uh, it is not in, in a time scale, but it's an, in a displacement scale. It's displacement dependent. If we think also in the loops, the hoops law is a force equal to uh, k, the stiffness times delta x. So it, what what is important is this delta x. Okay. This is not the time. Sorry, I made an imprecision. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Okay.